So thanks for joining me for this talk. Uh, it should hopefully be a bit different um, in terms of just being quite a fun talk about sort of security and this face-off between Mother Nature and how we can maybe learn lessons from evolution uh, and sort of the systems that exist within Mother Nature and Java and sort of our system and our applications. So this was supposed to be a talk, sort of a battle off between me and Steve. Steve has COVID, so it's just a battle off with me. Um, so it might be a little bit disjointed in terms of me versus me, but hopefully you guys get the gist. Um, and yeah, we're going to be looking at three different rounds for this. Um, and really we're looking at sort of just making you think a bit deeply about security, about how you can implement more of sort of a everyday health into your application development. So general health behaviors like washing your hands, what is the software equivalent? So how can we introduce more of that into our engineering pr practices? And we're going to be, as I said, using examples from biology. Don't panic. No humans were harmed in the making of this presentation. So as I said, so evolution has had billions of years to be able to develop really amazing defense systems and really complex defense systems at almost every stage of potential infection. And we're going to be taking a look at each of those three stages and taking a look at, okay, what can we learn? You know, software development really hasn't been around as long as evolution. So how can we make use of the lessons that evolution has already learned for us to be able to implement that within software development? And we're already seeing some of that today. You know, we're looking at things like algorithms. We've got algorithms that are based on nature. We've got ant algorithms and various other ones that are based on biology because biology's already done the hard work. So why not make use of it uh, and learn those lessons? So these are the various different sort of parts of the presentation today. So we're going to be taking a quick look at, okay, why does this even matter? What are the threats and the challenges that we're facing at the moment in terms of software development? Then we're going to go into prevention. Prevention is better than needing any of this in the first place. So we, if we can prevent ourselves getting infected, then that's always good news. Then we're going to take a look at detection. If we don't know we're infected and we don't know we're under attack, how on earth are we ever supposed to prevent it or, or stop it when we're actually being attacked? And then the last step is mitigation. So if we are infected, if we are getting attacked, if we had that sort of vulnerability exposed and utilized by someone maybe malicious, then how do we go about mitigating the impact of that and the consequences? So the first things first, what are the threats and the challenges? What are we facing today? Well, bad actors are just as ever still trying to get into our systems and they're doing it in ever more sophisticated methods. We've got things like drive-by attacks still happening. So this is essentially where you've just happened to leave a back door open somewhere. It wasn't that they targeted you. It wasn't that they were out to get you from the get-go. They just happened to try and attack you and got through because you left something open. You left a back door open. So these still happen regularly. Um, and it's basically just where they're taking advantage of vulnerabilities that you have within your system. Um, and this is what we're trying to prevent. Another one that's really common nowadays is ransomware attacks. Uh, this is essentially where they take control of your system and ask for a vast quantity of money to get that back. Uh, in fact, just recently, back in April, the Costa Rican government uh, had a ransomware attack. And in fact, the US have just announced that they they posted a $10 million, um, what's it called, uh, bounty for those who are involved. So. It is still happening to very large corporations and important and essential services. And this is sort of the difference between hacks that were maybe happening a decade ago and hacks that are happening now. A lot of the time, they're specifically targeting really essential services and infrastructure, looking at disrupting our supply chains, looking at sort of creating essentially cyber war within uh, software. So inf infiltrating things like manufacturing, infiltrating healthcare, um, and really, yeah, as I said, essential services that we rely on every day um, and that the vulnerable also rely on. And it really, their aim is to manipulate, it's to terminate, and it's to disrupt these key essential services. So we're all part of a supply chain and we will all be affected by this in some manner. Um, and your applications will be part of this supply chain in some way. So it's really important that we are considering security and implementing it effectively. 
And there's various different motivations for these bad actors. Um, some of them want to steal your data. So data is extremely valuable. If they're able to steal that data, they can maybe use it to their own advantage for malicious purposes, or they might simply just sell it because data is worth money. So by stealing their data, that's a monetary income for them. They might choose to change your data. That kind of seems like a weird one, like going in and not really doing that much with it, just changing it. But think about it this way. If you're changing data, maybe you can change your credit score. So suddenly you could get a nicer house. Maybe they can add in health information. Maybe they can take away health information. What if you could wipe someone's criminal record? All of these are important aspects of data that belong to us. And that if we start changing, that starts changing other aspects of our lives as well. They can also crash your system. So sometimes they just want to crash a system. Maybe it's to be disruptive. So maybe there's an end goal to that. Maybe by disrupting a particular manufacturer, perhaps they have stocks, for example, in a competitor, and thus they can gain a monetary value that way. So crashing your system is another motivation. A classic one, using your computing power. Bitcoin mining happens all the time. We had that in our own, we've got a cloud native um, sort of environment that you can do a lot of our labs on. And we had to put a login in because surprise, surprise, the Bitcoin miners came. So yeah, computing power using your resources in that way is a classic um, motivation. And another one is not just to use you, but to go through you to get to another system. That might just be to spread, for example. So they might be laying dormant, uh, and perhaps they're going to be activated all at once. And that way, by spreading further before creating any consequences, they can then create a really massive impact when they do actually activate whatever they're doing. Or it might just be because you don't have anything that's of interest to them, but perhaps you're connected to another system that is of interest and perhaps has something that they want. So all of these are motivations that bad actors have and essentially what they intend to do when they're creating these attacks and trying to get into your system. So where does this all come in with biology? How does this compare to real life in terms of biological bad actors and what they want from our bodies? So there's loads of different biological bad actors, just like there's loads of different uh, bad actors within software, and they all have different motivations as well. So we've got things like viruses, fungus, parasitic worms, protozoa, and bacteria, and they use your body for a wide variety of things as well. So your body actually is a, it's just a really comfy place, if I'm honest with you. It's, it's a great temperature, endless resources, food, comfort, and so it's a fantastic place for them to call their home. They might use you just as a host to simply replicate, and that's all they really want to do. They might be using you to be able to infect others, like I mentioned, going through you to be able to spread further and perhaps evolve to the point where you're not as immune to it. Um, or they might use you in a parasitic form for their own benefit. So if anyone is queasy at the sight of odd biological stuff, look away now. So this is a beetle with no insides. Um, How is it walking? Well, there's actually a parasite. Um, in this case, it's a fungus that's infected its brain that essentially controls its movement. So it's still able to control the neurological function um, to be able to move the muscles and the legs. And essentially, it will control this beetle to go to exactly where it wants to be. It will lock on. And then the beetle essentially just dies and it uses its body, uses those resources as a host to be able to then spread to other beetles and do exactly the same thing. So for anyone who doubted if zombies exist, <laughs> they definitely do. <laughs> so yeah, there's a wide variety of reasons and parasites I find one of the most interesting um, similarly in software. So comparing this to the sort of motivations that we were looking at in software, where does biology stack up? Why do our bodies get infected by all of these different bad actors? And it's the same sort of motivations. So where we had steal your data before, well, data is kind of a resource and our body is full of resources. Whether that's our DNA, whether that's our uh, replicating systems, whether that's the food available in our body, stealing our resources is a classic from bacteria, uh, parasites, etc. Whether that's as food or whether that's to be able to essentially have the mechanisms to help them replicate. Then there's editing your DNA, so changing your data. 
We have data in every single one of our cells in the form of DNA. And actually, there's some really clever viruses out there that will infect your cell and essentially insert their own DNA into our DNA inside our cells. So when your cell replicates, unknowingly, your body is replicating viruses at the same time. So it's really clever because essentially they don't have to worry about all the energy involved in replication and all that machinery they can just use ours. So again, it's kind of a use of resources and they can edit our data just like other bad actors in software. What about crushing our system? Well, I kind of showed you that with a the parasite. They can completely take over our systems at times. Uh, and, and in biology, there are a couple of examples of that. They also steal our energy reserves. So I've sort of, sort of made the analogy between compute resource and energy reserves. You know, Energy is essentially what keeps us going. Uh, the compute resources are what keeps our applications going. And again, bad actors in biology try and steal our energy. And just like we saw in software, they also try to go through us to get to others. So for example, the common cold, that is a classic, deliberately making you sneeze as far as possible to be able to spread that infection to other people um, and be able to continue infecting and evolving. So moving on to our various different rounds. The first round we've got here is prevention because as I said at the beginning, prevention is literally the best course of action to prevent that infection or that attack in the first place. So in biology, we have a variety of different prevention methods. The first one is essentially our skin. So having our skin there enables us to limit the number of orifices that enable bacteria and viruses and all those bad actors to get in. Essentially, we've limited it to essentially any opening. So you're talking like nose, mouth, eyes, etc. And at each of those orifices, we also have extra defenses. So we're aware that our skin protects most of us and that where we have those openings, we probably should be adding extra defense. In our eyes, we have teardrops, in our mouth, saliva, in our nostrils, mucus. So everywhere we have an opening, we have an extra layer of defense that then stops those infections, hopefully, from getting inside. As well as that, we've also developed additional characteristics like our enhanced senses. So for example, if I maybe went on holiday and forgot the milk in the fridge and I come back, I can smell that milk before I need to drink it and know that it's gone off. So being able to develop these enhanced senses that then protect our bodies from having things like gone off milk. So these enhanced sensors help us as well. In addition to that, at a smaller level, diving sort of deeper into the body, we also have what we call flags on our cells. So if you imagine a cell with a cell wall, there are various different sort of proteins that are attached to the cell wall, and some of them act as flags that essentially identify it as your own cell. So that's why, for example, when you have an organ transplant, the cells that make up those organs don't match your identification flag. And that's why often when you have that transplant, you have to have immunosuppressant drugs so that your body doesn't reject the organ. It's a similar concept. That the whole point of it, really, that defense mechanism, is to stop potential infections. So when those infections come in, we can then identify, well, that flag ain't mine, and say, that shouldn't be here. Uh, so those flag identifications help us to essentially have that ID and that checking to be able to stop infection. Another one is, I talked about the skin, but what happens if we get an opening in the skin? So for example, I fall over, scrape my knee, suddenly I've got an opening where there shouldn't be one. Um, and our body has an amazing ability to really quickly form scabs to stop that orifice from being open anymore um, and to try and prevent any bacteria from getting in. Another one is homeostasis, so taking you right back to secondary school. Uh, if you remember homeostasis in your biology lessons from back then, it is essentially your body's way of maintaining a constant uh, internal environment. It includes things like temperature, uh, things like your water levels within your body, all sorts of various things that essentially enable life to survive. So homeostasis also enables us to be able to prevent infection by keeping us at those ideal levels. And then behavioral changes, hence my caveman on the slide. So just things like cooking, putting it on a fire, being able to cook our food enabled us to prevent bacterial infections from uncooked meats, for example. So we've gradually changed behavior over time to be able to prevent those infections from going on or from getting in our bodies. One we've done recently is masks for COVID. 
you know, we're seeing behavioral changes and evolution in our behavior all the time. Um, you know, previously, we might not have washed our hands way, way back, but now we do. So all of these behavioral changes, as well as the anatomical behaviors, help us to prevent that initial infection. What about software? <laughs> so software does have a lot of the ability to be able to do a lot of similar things. So for example, reducing the number of orifices. How many of you have, let's say, just happened to open something up to be able to make like testing your application easier or developing your application easier and suddenly you've got an opening that you might forget to close or someone might be able to take advantage of. By preventing those sort of ad hoc orifices from appearing within your application, using things like API gateways to have that single point of entry into your application means that you know exactly how many orifices you have and exactly where you need to add those additional defenses. And that enables you to reduce your chance of, as I said, inadvertently adding those extra entry points and those extra points of potential infection. So API gateways can be a great way of really managing that through one central point. Another one is security checks and input validation. So here we're looking at, okay, who is trying to access my system? Do they have authority to do that? What can I give them access to? So here we're looking at, so it's sort of similar to when I was talking about those cell identification tags. So being able to identify someone and know, should they be here? Are we allowing them in? And this helps to prevent just really crude intrusion and manipulation attacks. There's also things like dependency management tools. So really keeping current with those dependencies um, and preventing potential known vulnerabilities can be really helpful. It's kind of like getting vaccinated. So when we get vaccinated, it essentially teaches our body what that particular infection looks like. So the next time we get infected with that same infection or that same bacteria, for example, or virus, we then are able to respond a lot quicker and hopefully prevent it before we start noticing any symptoms. So that's the really essentially why we have all the things like COVID vaccinations, flu vaccinations. It can help us and our bodies to prevent uh, potential future infections. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're essentially knowing about a vulnerability and actively doing something about that so that we don't get taken advantage of in that same way in the future. So it's essentially future-proofing our applications. And nowadays, there are some pretty nasty vulnerabilities out there. I don't think I need to tell you guys that, considering the log for shell stuff. So if you haven't already checked out some of the talks, there's some great talks on those sort of subjects uh, here at the conference. So yeah, being able to use things like dependency management tools enables us to automate that and really stay on top of it. And then things like automated high-speed CICD, again, it keeps that vulnerability window as small as possible. So enabling us to be able to go as quickly from development through to production really effectively so that we s sort of shorten that window. So potential vulnerabilities that might have been introduced in that time are narrowed. So again, all of this is sort of relating into those key concepts I mentioned before, trying to minimize the orifices, checking who we're letting in and out and what we're letting in and out, ensuring that we're trying to keep those vulnerabilities limited um, and reducing those vulnerability windows, just like that scab forming, doing it as quickly as possible to reduce that vulnerability. So for this round, it's a draw. You'll notice my animals throughout. I just can't resist. Um, so yeah, for this round, we're going to call it a draw because really, if you are doing a lot of these software, if you're using these toolings, you're using this methodology, you're implementing these principles, there are the tools available to enable you to have effective prevention within your applications. So uh, like as I said, if you take software security seriously, you should be able to implement the equivalents in software to what we have within biology. And although you might not think of yourselves as developers, as sort of security experts, you are that first line of defense. You are making the code that is then potentially at risk. So you should be that first line of defense and you should be thinking about security throughout the application development. And really it's just like basic hygiene, just those basic principles of the security version of washing your hands, just ensuring that you are making sure that you're not opening random orifices into your software applications um, and ensuring that you are enabling each of these sort of toolings like the dependency management, the CICD, all of that can be stuff that you can implement. Uh, and all elements of software lifecycle should be taken into account for this. So that's round one, it's a draw. What about round two? 
So this is where we have detection. So this is where we have potentially been infected already. And now we're looking at, OK, how do we detect that we've been infected? Uh, and what can we do about that? So in biology, we have had years of tuning this system. We have a really advanced system. It's really clever and is like a whole degree in itself. It's insane. There's a lot to do with it. So in terms of actually trying to detect foreign bodies within our system, within our bodies, we have our, essentially our immune system. So this is the adaptive immune system. Uh, and this includes things like white blood cells. So they're the things that kind of come along and like destroy anything that shouldn't be there. Normally they sort of abs absorb it, I guess, and then just like dissolve it. Uh, we also have things like antibodies. So they're the Y-shaped things that you see in the diagram. And essentially they're specific to each uh, virus or particular infection. And that's what we train our bodies to create when we have vaccines. So what they do is they attach themselves. They're like, oh, I recognize that guy. He shouldn't be here and attach themselves to it. And that sends a flag to white blood cells passing through to say, oh, that's definitely not meant to be here. It also helps to clump them together as well, making it much easier to destroy those potential infections. So all of these are really helpful. We've also got rapid learning. So being able to rapidly learn what should and shouldn't be there. Viruses are constantly trying to outsmart our bodies by evolving and changing to the point where we don't recognize them. So our bodies have had to get really good at quickly learning and understanding how they've evolved and that they're kind of the same thing, just looking different. We've also got extra protection through the use of vaccines, like I mentioned. This really enables us to future-proof our bodies Rather than having to go through the infection in the first place, we can sort of skip that stage and go straight to protection. And then we've also got cell signaling. So we have some really clever biology where if a cell, for example, gets infected and it's able to recognize that it's been infected and is maybe performing a bit weirdly um, and it's able to recognize that, it can send out a self-destruct message. So it essentially says, kill me, because if you don't kill me, the rest of the body is going to get infected. So it's this sort of self-sacrificial behavior that enables us to protect the rest of the cells around it. Other detection that we have, you might not think about it as detection of infection, but pain can be a really great indicator when something is wrong in the body. So for example, you've got appendicitis and you don't know, suddenly you get crippling abdominal pain. That is a great indicator that something is not right in your body. Um, and actually, this is where a lot of the time we tend to mask the pain uh, and those signals from our body by using painkillers. Um, so maybe I've got a headache uh, and I take some paracetamol or whatever. Um, but really, what I probably should have done is drink some water because I'm probably dehydrated. So pain can actually be a really good indicator. And sometimes we ignore it because the pain can be deferred, for example. A lot of the time, it's not at the location of the infection. So for example, like years ago, I had gallstones and I got pain everywhere in my stomach because we don't always have pain receptions at the point where we have uh, those particular issues. And so deferred pain can also be a really great indicator, even if it doesn't tell you exactly where the problem is. When it comes to software detection, normally it's a little bit too late when we get those detection signals. So we might find out because our system crashed, or maybe we're getting complaints about performance of our application, or a particular feature isn't working. Or we get a really lovely note from the attackers letting us know that they've hacked our system, which is really not good. Uh, ransomware, or we get a little note to say, oh, your data is now on the dark web. All of these are essentially too little too late. Um, so we do need to improve in the software detection side of things. There are some tools that can help us with this. So for example, we can implement specific monitoring software that can help us to start spotting attacks. Um, and we can start to spot sort of similar behavior patterns. So things like AI-powered tools can help us to start spotting those patterns within our applications. And sometimes that can be something as simple as just monitoring our resource usage. So that's a classic when it comes to things like Bitcoin mining. If suddenly that CPU usage starts spiking, you've probably got an issue uh, and your application isn't behaving as expected. So spotting these replicating patterns, even if it's not identifying the exact problem, at least gives us an indication that something's wrong and that we should be looking into this further. 
Uh, and so this is where I sort of compare it to indirect pain. That fact that, okay, we know our system isn't quite right, but we're not entirely sure why, and we don't know exactly where that issue is. But at least it's a, f a red flag to essentially say, okay, but this needs looking into. But we don't actually write a lot of our applications to have these pain sensors. So we need to be, as software developers, looking at, okay, how can I implement things like monitoring? How can I uh, have a baseline, for example, of what my application behavior should look like to be able to compare that and know when things are going wrong and the application isn't behaving as expected. So in this round, biology wins, I'm afraid to say. We still have a while to go in terms of improving detection within software. Um, Detection is really needed for us to be able to actually take action and to guide autonomic uh, processes. In organizations, it's a little bit different, right? In, in our software applications, you gotta give them credit. You know, we can just restart the application. Most of the time, it's okay. In software, you don't get a restart, okay? If, if your system crashes, then that usually results in some serious complications and there ain't, you know, a, well, unless you believe in some religions, usually there's no second life. So really, in biology, this is essential, and that's why evolution has evolved to be able to do this so well. But we can learn some lessons. So for example, some of the next steps that you might want to take in terms of maybe looking at how you could improve this within your own applications is maybe investigating some of the monitoring solutions that are out there. Can you make use of any of the AI monitoring tools? Can you start monitoring your own application, like your resource usage, to be able to uh, analyze those patterns and know potentially when things are going wrong? Um, and can you instrument your applications so that that unexpected behavior is recorded in some way? Maybe it's through logs, maybe it's through some other tool, uh, but can you record that so then you can compare it uh, in the future, for example, just like a vaccination, so you can future-proof your application against maybe similar infections or attacks in the future? And bear in mind, a dull ache, even as bad as a headache can be, is still useful, it's better than nothing. So having these sort of dull aches, this indirect pain is still useful for our applications. What about round three? So now we've gone through, we've looked at how can we prevent it? How can we detect it? What do we do when we actually get infected? So in biology, uh, we do have a bunch of different things that we use. So vaccinations help us to prepare our body for when it's inevitably gonna be infected with something. We have the adaptive immune system. So there's two different kinds of immune system in your body. There's the innate immune system, which essentially, as the name suggests, it's innate, so it's just always there. And that's things like your skin, etc. And then we have the adaptive immune system, and that's the cells within your body that are actively learning to be able to recognize those new infections. So this, again, helps us to be able to rapidly identify cells that shouldn't be there and attacks on our bodies. We also have some amazing behaviors that we find super annoying, which is understandable, but they do help us to make the body less habitable for those infections. So when you have a fever, for example, and your temperature spikes, that's not just your body getting annoyed at you, it is deliberately doing that to make it less habitable for the infection within your body. Things like shivering, et cetera, like all of these behaviors throwing up when you have an infection within you, all of these behaviors make your body less habitable for any infection that's trying to get in. Getting rid of foreign cells that might be up or down. Um, we've all had it before, maybe food poisoning. Um, that's our body's way of trying to eject all of that infection before it's able to get through those cell walls and into the rest of our bodies. We also have this amazing ability, which is sort of something that's been discovered recently, where we're able to actually coat our DNA in molecules to be able to prevent viruses from injecting their own DNA into ours. So again, trying to prevent them making use of our replication machinery. We also limit our access to our body and we patrol our access routes. So we have white blood cells constantly patrolling the blood circulation within our body to be able to potentially spot anything that's managed to get past those initial defenses and it could rapidly respond. So we have a really advanced system to be able to mitigate any potential infection before the consequences get too much. In software, it's not quite so sophisticated. So for example, if you've not come across this before, so OWASP, this stands for Open Web Application Security Project. So this is a non-profit foundation that really focuses on software uh, security and enables you 
through so, sort of resources like security by design principles. It gives you a really great list of some design principles you can implement in your own applications to be able to mitigate these attacks. So if you've not checked that out, definitely go and check out the website and that resource. Something we can do that can help to mitigate those potential attacks is literally as simple as making quality code. It is amazing how much harder it can be to add in malicious code if your code is of good quality. So if you've got code where you've, you know what every single line within that class does, it's going to be a lot harder for someone to sneak in code that does something else that your application is not supposed to do. If you've got code that maybe you've gone to Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow is like, oh yeah, you can just use this, and you maybe don't know what's happening at every single line of that code, it's going to be a lot easier for someone to sneak in additional methods, additional calls, additional requests that you don't know what's happening within it. So by making code better quality, com using comments, understanding every aspect of it, not just copying and pasting uh, features or functionality that you think will suit your needs, this can make it a lot harder for malicious attacks to come in and take advantage of that. So that's just a really simple step that we can do to be able to stop those attacks and mitigate the consequences. Another thing that maybe we don't think about that much is to reduce our data output and organize our use cases. So for example, if I'm requesting from a particular service, um, if I send them, okay, I want to get Noddy's address, and then it sends back, okay, here's Noddy, Noddy's ID one, their email address is, their account number is, like, do I need that information? Should I be giving that service that information if the only thing I've requested is their address? Really, what we could do is cut it down just to the ID, which is Noddy's ID, and the address, which means that if anyone's intercepting that, uh, that request, for example, or that payload, they're not getting as much information that isn't necessarily needed. So cutting down the amount of data we are outputting. And along similar lines, reducing the raw data we're doing as well. Can we encode that raw data at all? Does it need to be readable by a human? Or can we be, just make it readable by a machine? So in this case, at the top, if you were to intercept that as a hacker, I know exactly what that is. That's a date. And I can see exactly what date that is. Maybe I can use that to my advantage. Whereas if I was to set a date and then said, OK, take this date as the microservice. And if you're using this particular request, just take that date and add the offset. When I read this as a hacker, if I'm intercepting this request, I'm not necessarily going to know what that offset means or how to interpret that. So by changing the way that we enable our requests and, and using sort of changes in our raw data, we can again add this layer of protection for hackers and malicious bad actors who are trying to access and use our data. So this is another method, so reducing our raw data or even encoding it. Another thing, authorization. Please don't just give people like no access or all the access. There are in-betweens. So don't make them a baby or a superhero. There are lots of in-betweens that you can use. A lot of the time, we just give people all the authorization to be able to access everything. And really, we should be doing it on a needs and a use case basis. Do they need all of that uh, access? Do they need to access everything that that authorization level gives them? And if they don't, then create an authorization level that suits that particular need and give that to that person. So really thinking about, OK, what should they be authorized to access? And is that needed? Again, this all helps to be able to reduce your risk when it comes to potential infection or attacks. And then mitigation. So this is sort of similar to what I've been saying throughout. Report any unexpected behavior. So you can take a look at your data and start analyzing, OK, things like the state of the data or your logs, checking out deviations in that and reporting that, not just ignoring it. Um, and thinking about things like, you know, thinking wider than just your generic attacks. So not all attacks will come from one IP address. Can you start spotting a botnet that's trying to authenticate with multiple different computers, for example? So really reporting those unexpected behaviors and having some kind of response to those. Handling errors intelligently. This is another one that we as devs can implement. So for example, let's say that I have, I'm trying to access a file through this particular request, and I'm used to getting an exception if that file doesn't exist. If I'm used to that exception, make it specific. So add in a file not found exception 
and then catch the rest. Don't just catch everything because there might be other exceptions that are going on that you're ignoring because you're, you're used to expecting that file not found exception. So really make your exceptions specific and handle them intelligently. That's another way that we can potentially see unexpected behavior and stop those attacks. Uh, and test your dependencies. So this is going right back to that uh, sort of testing that I was talking about before. Uh, we are using, you know, only about 20% of our code is really custom code. We rely for the rest on dependencies, and have you actually checked them? We need to keep checking the features that we rely on within our applications, uh, because a lot of them are open source, and open source communities, as amazing as they are, are open to potential attacks and infection. So making sure that you're keeping on top of your dependency management. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to cover in this section was the fact that, you know, previously we had this sort of uh, time before uh, we were able to sort of before reporting and exploitation. So we had time to actually deal with that potential vulnerability before anyone was actually able to exploit it. Nowadays, however, this window isn't closing, this window is closed. Okay, the time between exploitation and reporting is the opposite, we've gone the opposite way. People start exploiting it before it gets reported. So we have literally no time to be able to deal with it before we get exploited. That's why things like detection and prevention are extremely important because we don't really have any time for mitigation anymore. So that's why it's really important to focus on the first two of these. Obviously the third is important and we'd love to improve it, uh, but it is the case of normally we're already being exploited by that time. So I'm um, unfortunately, uh, biology wins again, which is great for me, not so good for imaginary Steve. Um, but yeah, so biology wins in this case, but again, this is because we would essentially die if we didn't. Um, it's extremely important that we mitigate within biology, and that's why we have such strong adaptive immune systems. It is critical for us to be able, as animals uh, and living creatures, it's critical for us to be able to adapt to changing environments because Things that are attacking us are changing all the time. Um, and there are serious consequences if we fail at this. For software, the consequences are getting more important and they are getting higher. Um, not quite to the same degree most of the time. Uh, however, we do need to try and keep uh, implementing and innovating within our security practices to be able to deal with this changing environment and these ever increasing sophisticated hacks and attacks. So overall, I'm afraid in this battle, Mother Nature wins, but hopefully what we can take away from this is the fact that you know, we can learn from Mother Nature, we can implement these principles and these concepts within software development. So living organisms are pretty amazing. We kind of knew that already, but this sort of just takes it to a whole new level and a whole new appreciation. But Java applications can do a lot of these functionalities if we just start implementing it in our design principles. Uh, we need to be designing for defense across our application development, and we need to be taking the time to actually understand the security measures we need to be putting in place and the attacks that we're being put under. Um, so yeah, an application is just one cell in your system. You might be using various other cells to implement your whole application, but if you're just going to be implementing one cell, make it an effective one. So any useful links, so these are some of the useful links. If you want to get hands on with some security and open source, uh, we've got some open liberty guides that you can check out. They use that, um, the cloud native infrastructure that I was mentioning earlier, the one that got hacked by Bitcoin miners, so you will need to log in, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, you can make use of that and you don't need any prerequisites. There's also Sonatype, so Steve, imaginary Steve, who's presenting with me, it works at Sonatype, so check out Sonatype. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, that guide for design principles um, from that foundation. And if you have any questions or you want to go deeper into security, there are some fantastic labs that are being done today by Sonatype and by Sneak. So definitely check those out and go and chat to them at the booths. Uh, they have some fantastic security tools, a lot of which is open source. So thanks very much for listening. And I'll speak to you afterwards, I guess.